I'm next going to introduce um, Dr. Devin Hall. Dr. Hall is the newest member of our movement disorder group here at McMaster. Um, she did her neurology training at Western University in London, followed by a movement disorder fellowship at Columbia University in New York. And um, she just started her practice in the fall, and we're very happy to have her. Um, she is speaking today about when and how to start medication for Parkinson's, so she may be able to answer some of your questions. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so uh, today I'll be talking about um, when we should be starting medications to treat Parkinson's disease um, and how to determine what medications to start. So I'm really talking about sort of early on in the um, Parkinson's disease course. So starting off first with um, when should we be starting treatment? So the timing to start treatment is a matter of some debate. Um, however, ultimately, the medications that we have available to us at this point in time are what we call symptomatic treatments. Um, and so we tend to reserve treatment for when symptoms have started impacting a person's function or their quality of life. However, you will notice, as physicians, we really like uh, our research. Um, and so um, we've had a lot of research dedicated to examining if there's a role for early intervention. Um, and we sort of already mentioned, but to date, we don't have any proven treatments that either cure Parkinson's disease or slow the progression. But, you know, there's ongoing research, and so we're very hopeful that one day we will have such treatments available to us. Um, there is a medication that we sometimes use in Parkinson's disease where there is some controversy over whether it may slow disease, the disease progression. Um, there's been a lot of research that's been dedicated to this, and at this point, we're still, we'll, we're still not certain. Um, there also have been many um, research studies that have examined the question as to whether we should be delaying the treatment in Parkinson's disease. And so I've just selected four here. Um, but really to summarize what they show um, is that there is no significant difference in the long-term outcomes um, in terms of quality of life um, when, or um, disability um, if we delay treatment versus we started early. So really, um, the main thing is, is there may be improved quality of life earlier on if we start treatment early. So we certainly at this point don't have any evidence to suggest that we should be delaying treatment um, if it's required for symptom control. So next, I just wanted to review quickly some of the medications that we have available um, for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So levodopa is our gold standard medication. So it's the medication to which we are comparing all of our other treatments um, in Parkinson's disease. It really was our first, um, the first treatment that we had available. And so how, do, uh, how levodopa works is the body converts it to dopamine, which is the chemical that the um, brain is missing in people who have Parkinson's disease. And so we give levodopa with, um, in combination with another medication, so either carbidopa or benserazide. Um, and those medications really serve to prevent the breakdown of levodopa. So it thereby enhances the benefits um, of the levodopa and also reduces some of the side effects. And so you probably will recognize some of these uh, medications. So again, the two formulations that we have available are levodopa carbidopa, the brand name being Cinemat, um, and then levodopa benserazide or prolopa. And so really, we don't have a lot of guidelines or evidence to tell us what dose or formulation or frequency we should be giving the medication um, to minimize complications. It's really an individual uh, we really give medication on an individualized basis. Um, but this is sort of my general um, starting dose, and I like to go very slowly in terms of starting a medication just to try to minimize the side effects. And someone was mentioning before um, whether um, levodopa interacts with protein, and so 
Um, I'm in agreement. I think that, you know, we certainly know that protein sort of competes and can reduce the amount of absorption um, of levodopa. But you'll see here that I often start um, with the medication giving it with food. And I do that mostly because I think um, it tends to lower the risks of one of the most common side effects that we have with the medication, which is nausea and vomiting. Um, usually early in the disease course, it's probably not as important that we get every little bit, we absorb every little bit of levodopa, but that does become important sort of as the disease progresses. And so sometimes then we have to change around the timing of meals and medication. So as I mentioned, uh, side effects. So unfortunately, all of our medications have side effects. Um, not everyone experiences all of them, but they're good to be aware of. So as I mentioned before, often the, um, the, on the lower doses of medication, the side effects that we see most commonly with levodopa is the nausea and vomiting. But as we increase the dose, we can also see things like hypotension, which is low blood pressure, which people might experience as some lightheadedness or dizziness, um, sleepiness. We can have the dyskinesias, which are those extra sort of wiggly movements that you see um, people like M Michael J. Fox having. Um, and again, usually at higher doses, we can see things like hallucinations. Um, and if it's taken later in the evening, some people will tell us that they have very vivid dreams. So another category of medication that we use to treat Parkinson's um, disease is a, medic or a class of medication called the dopamine agonists. Um, and so these medications don't actually um, get converted to the dopamine, but instead they, have, they act um, in the same areas of the brain um, as the dopamine would. Oops. Um, so there are three main formulations that we typically use. And so two of these come in tablet form. So they're the Pramipexol and the Ropinerol. Um, and then we also have one that can be worn as a patch on the skin, and so that's rotigotine. And so once again, um, there are a number of side effects that people can experience when they're on dopamine agonists. I'd like to highlight again um, the first one on the list, which are the impulse control disorders. So these are things like an increased sexual drive, pathological shopping, gambling, excessive eating. It's really important if you're experiencing these side effects, you know, um, to let your physician know. Um, sometimes they're quite mild, but um, they can uh, become quite severe, and the consequences of them in those cases can be um, very devastating. Other side effects include things like peripheral edema, so swelling in the legs, um, daytime sleepiness. Some people can even ha sort of have sleep attacks, so in the middle of a conversation or driving. So it's really important, again, if you're experiencing this, to let us know, because we certainly don't want you falling asleep on the road. Um, uh, orthostatic hypotension, so again, low blood pressure. Uh, if you're using the patch, obviously there's a potential for some irritation of the skin. Um, and as Dr. Attar already mentioned, there is a possibility for a withdrawal syndrome. So if we need to start, stop this medication for whatever reason, we often try to do so very slowly to, to avoid this. So another medication are those MAOB inhibitors, and these really um, try to prevent the breakdown of dopamine. So um, if we do that, we, the hope is that we're able to increase the amount of dopamine that's in the brain. And so the two medications that, we, um, that are in this category are selegiline and risagiline. And so overall, these medications tend to have less side effects um, than the dopamine agonists or uh, levodopa. They still do have a few, come with a few side effects. So again, nausea and vomiting, um, as well as lightheadedness. Um, in the case of selegiline, we can also see some insomnia. So we typically recommend that this medication is taken earlier in the day to try to prevent this. So amantadine is another uh, medication that we use. Um, so it works in a couple of ways. So one, it sort of blocks the action um, of another chemical in the brain called uh, glutamate. Um, but it also tries to, or it also seems to enhance the release of dopamine in the brain. So increasing the amounts that are available for the, the brain cells. So later in the disease, often we're using this medication for those wiggly uh, dyskinesias. But early in Parkinson's disease, we sometimes use this medication to treat the tremor. So this is just the amantidine there. 
And then once again, looking at the side effects. So the side effects here include things like confusion, hallucination, dry mouth, constipation, lightheadedness, levito reticularis, which is this sort of lace-like rash, um, and uh, swelling in the legs. And then the final medication that I was going to talk about um, this afternoon are the anticholinergic medications. So these medications also act on a different chemical in the brain, which is um, the acetylcholine, and so they block um, where this chemical acts. Um, we sometimes use this medication in patients um, or individuals with Parkinson's disease, usually who are younger than um, 70, and in whom tremor is really the predominant symptom. And so some of the medications in this category include trihexyphenidyl and benzotropine. And so the side effects here are similar to the last medication. So there's some dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, um, difficulty emptying the bladder, so urinary retention, uh, confusion, con oh, sorry, cognitive impairment, hallucinations, some drowsiness, and again, problems with the blood pressure, so a low blood pressure. So you'll see basically all of the medications that we're using to treat the Parkinson's can unfortunately um, affect the blood pressure. So now that we know what medications that we have available um, to us in Parkinson's disease, how are we making the decisions um, to choose which medication to start? Um, and so really, this depends on the individual, um, but we do have some information um, to help guide that decision. And really, it should be a discussion between you and your physician. And so the biggest sort of reason to start a dopamine agonist over levodopa is that there is a, a significant reduction in the risk of motor complications. So in, in particular, things like the dyskinesias. And so this delay in dyskinesias um, when we start dopamine agonists is mostly appreciated in uh, individuals who are younger than 70. Oops, I'll just go back, sorry. Um, the other thing to mention is that even if we're using the dopamine agonist early, it does not um, prevent the development of those dyskinesias uh, once levodopa is started down the line. So I think many um, patients as well as their physicians are quite concerned that levodopa is toxic or that it loses its effect. Um, and therefore they delay treatment. But this isn't really the case. The reason that the dose of the levodopa increases over time is because of the progression of the underlying Parkinson's disease. Um, and the other thing to mention is that levodopa seems to have a greater effect on those motor symptoms, so the stiffness, the slowness, um, and the shaking, um, than some of the other medications. So as I mentioned, the dopamine agonists have a lower risk of those motor complications, so things like the dyskinesia, but they have a higher risk of the non-motor complications, so those impulse control disorders, the confusion, cognitive impairment, hallucinations, um, and symptoms like that. Um, and therefore, we really try to avoid them in um, uh, individuals who are older than 70, because they just seem to be at a higher risk of, um, it, um, of developing some of those side effects. And so the dopamine agonists also seem to have more modest effects on some of those motor symptoms. So really, um, the long-term sort of disability and quality of life really doesn't differ in between um, those who are started first on the dopamine agonist versus the levodopa. And so, as I said before, it really is looking at the individual, the person who's before us, um, and sort of the symptoms that they're experiencing um, that um, would really guide in terms of what medications um, should be started. But sort of as a general rule um, in my practice, I look at starting levodopa again if someone is older than 70 or if they're, they're, they come in with really severe symptoms. Um, I would consider using one of the non-levodopa agents, so like the MAOB inhibitors or the dopamine agonists, um, in someone who is less than 65 and has milder symptoms. Happy to take any questions.
what? Actually, that dark one took my memory to your breath. Oh, okay. It's okay. You can take your question. Sorry. Any questions? Oh, sorry, right in the front here? Okay. Is retiree available in Canada? No. It's not available in Canada. Um, so the question was, is Ritari available? So Ritari is um, a formulation of the levodopa carbidopa um, that's available in the United States. So it's sort of a combination of both the immediate release uh, levodopa carbidopa and the controlled release, but we don't have that available yet in Canada. Have you ever had a patient who you started on levodopa and eventually decided to switch to a dopamine agonist? Have I had that experience? I would say um, it sometimes happens occasionally. Um, I've done it a few times again because it tends to have sort of, as we mentioned before, this sort of this longer duration of action. So people who are having a lot of wearing off, sometimes that is a, a medication that can be very helpful. Um, it also tends to have less um, of the nausea and vomiting, and so I have had a few patients who we started on the levodopa carbidopa and just were having so much nausea and vomiting that we couldn't control with any other medications. They were losing weight, and so we switched them over, and uh, and they've done quite well on that. So uh, I do sometimes make the switch. I would say it's not as common as sort of making the other switch from dopamine and agonist to levodopa. Oh, in the back. Has... Uh, so far today, nobody has mentioned anything about medical uh, marijuana or cannabis. Mm -hmm. Has anybody started working with that? I think there's some research that's being done. So I know, you know, we, uh, in the neurology field, it's being used for some other um, conditions. So a lot for um, nerve pain, as well as um, for some individuals with seizures. So, um, you know, we are starting to use it in the neurological field. I know there hasn't been as many studies done um, in Parkinson's disease. So as I said before, we like research. So as physicians, we're waiting to see more, more data on that. Um, I did practice in, uh, or I did do my fellowship in the United States, um, where, um, in New York, where marijuana, um, medical marijuana had already been legalized. Um, and so it was still only being used primarily in Parkinson's disease for people who were having pain or were having severe nausea from the medication to try to help them tolerate that. Um, and again, this is not research, but I would say from what we saw, there didn't seem to be much of a change otherwise in terms of the Parkinson's other than sometimes in that people were a little bit more relaxed. Maybe they noticed a little bit less tremor. but I think more research really needs to be done. Uh, Parkinson's has affected my ability to swallow. Mm -hmm. And I've got around this by taking my, my many medications one at a time, followed by a teaspoonful of forage. Water doesn't work as well for the swallowing. Okay. And while I've got this, I've got one other point. Sorry. Okay. I was watching a news program from Detroit, and they advertised for volunteers to test a new Parkinson's drug developed by Binghamton University in upstate New York called D512. The fact that I can remember the number is a real credit. <laughs> All right, so yes, I mean, certainly we know that swallowing can be a problem um, in Parkinson's um, disease, and so the medications like the levodopa carbidopa that come in tablets, we can crush, and so some people will take it in applesauce. I know the taste isn't always ideal. Um, there also is the rotigotine patch, which is another way that we can get around sometimes um, the swallowing, but it certainly can be a very difficult uh, symptom, and it often doesn't respond as well to the medications as some of the other, um, you know, the stiffness and the slowness. I think there's a question up at the front. Um, one of the doctors uh, previous to your presentation mentioned, um, I think it was Dr. Paul Seth, mentioned um, uh, inflammation. Mm -hmm. So is the inflammation um, of the whole body 
would, would that be of the whole body, the inflammation? Um, in terms of the inflammation, I, I don't think we entirely know, because this was sort of a study that was looking more at the effects of the medi of medication that are known to reduce inflammation in the body, but it, it's not known, therefore, if there is, um, you know, if this is a generalized sort of a whole body inflammation or if it's inflammation more more in the brain. We certainly need to do um, more research on that. There is some... Um, some reports that there might be some inflammation in the brain, but I don't know if we're aware as much of inflammation at other parts of the body. But we do know that the nervous system um, goes everywhere in the body, and certainly that um, we do see changes related to Parkinson's sort of every, you know, in all of these different places where the nervous system is. And the reason I ask that is because um, following up on the cannabis uh, question previous, I understand that cannabis oil. Um, uh, is supposed to um, take away your inflammation. And if it was to do with inflammation, what would, uh, if you reduce the inflammation, what do you think would be the outcome? So this is, I guess, purely speculation because we still don't know. So it's hard to know. I don't think we've, we have enough sort of long-term sort of data looking at this, um, the effects of marijuana or the effects if we were to use sort of this anti-inflammatory treatment to know whether or not, um, you know, would it, would it slow the progression of Parkinson's disease or would it stop it? I don't think we have enough information to know. I'm hoping that, you know, with more research, we'll have clearer answers. So my, um, I kind of asked the question backward. I think I was trying to ask if inflammation was a factor uh, and you took away the inflammation, um, what, would inc what would be better? Or what would be better? Do you know? Do you know the effects of inflammation on the body? So it would depend on where the inflammation is. So certainly, you know, um, again, we, because we don't know a lot in terms of the effects of, of any of these an anti-inflammatory, we don't know where the inflammation is in Parkinson's disease or if it is sort of the cause or sort of the effect. So is there something happening in the body is sort of reacting to that or is the inflammation itself really causing the damage uh, and, the Parkin um, and causing the Parkinson's disease? I don't think we know enough. So I think I, I'm not sure as if we reduce the inflammation, what would happen um, to know if the, the symptoms would sort of, if things would sort of, um, sort of stabilize or if they would improve, it, it's, it's very difficult to say at this point. Thank you.